You guys, I my I've worked for Southern Signal for almost 10 years. Okay. And I've learned a lot over the past 10 years. And that's why kind of the subtitle of this presentation is revelations over the years, because I didn't come from the Wi-Fi space. I had to learn it from scratch starting 10 years ago. I came from the call center space. All right. So I knew all about ACD and IVR and CTI. And if you know what those things are, then I love you. All right, we're kindred spirits. Then I came into the Wi-Fi world and I had to learn all of this stuff from scratch, okay? And so one of my mentors, obviously, along this path was Veli Pekka Ketanen, all right, VP. And some of you may know who VP is. He founded Seven Signal. He's um, at Ubiquity these days, doing great work at Ubiquity, wow. But I remember some profound statements that he gave me early on, okay? Early on, he made some statements about Wi-Fi that helped me get a grasp on what it was and how it worked. He said things like, Eric, it's a very polite protocol. It's a listen before talk protocol. How does it work? I don't understand that. These are weird concepts to me because, you know, we just think that everything works simultaneously. I had to understand the idea of following a protocol, okay, the 802.11 protocol. And so he had to break it down for me. And granted, I mean, it took a while for me to really understand and to pick it up so that I could then explain it to others, right? So you, you, you only, you don't realize you know something until you're asked to explain it to somebody else. And if you're able to successfully explain it to somebody else, then hey, you know what? You learned it. How about that? This one at a time walkie talkie analogy was so helpful. So helpful. You know, I remember he would, we would play pretend, right? And, and VP would put his finger on the pretend walkie talkie button and he would pretend like he was talking to me. And he would say, Eric, now you can't talk. You have to, you have to wait. That's why when I'm done talking, I'm going to say something like over and let go of the button, indicating that I've now just cleared the channel. Because the channel is occupied by VP when he pushes the button. And now he talks, and then he says over, and then he lets go of the button. And now I can talk. And that concept, that's how Wi-Fi works, really, was so bizarre to me. I didn't understand, and it took me a while to figure it out and to unpack it. And I'm going to unpack a little bit of that for you today, okay? Because Wi-Fi, it, it's, there, there is just, it's unlicensed spectrum. And so it's really noisy out there, okay? A lot of Wi-Fi environments look like this. It's like going into a noisy sports bar, okay? And everybody's yelling and everybody's screaming and everybody's cheering and you can't even hear the person next to you, okay? And it's a frustrating experience if you're trying to have a conversation with somebody. And that's why we need a protocol. A protocol, the 802.11 protocol, ensures that we can hear, we can talk, we can communicate. Okay. It ensures that we can have conversations like this, okay, where we can be intimate with one another from the standpoint of you can hear me, I can hear you, we can talk intelligently nicely and communicate properly, okay? The foundation of all of this is something that we call the clear channel assessment, okay? The clear channel assessment. Again, we have to follow a protocol. If everybody's yelling and everybody's screaming in the sports bar, cheering for the football team or whatever, we can't hear each other. We can't communicate properly. So how do we ensure that we can have these productive one-on-one -on -one conversations where we can transmit and receive nicely? The foundation of it all is the clear channel assessment. So we need to understand that first and foremost when talking about Wi-Fi basics, Wi-Fi fundamentals. If you don't understand the clear channel assessment, then you don't understand how Wi-Fi works. And then therefore, all of the other topics that build upon, uh, that 
are coming out, I mean, all of the new stuff that we've got, OFDMA, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, it doesn't make sense unless we understand the foundation of it all. Okay. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. It starts with signal detect. Okay. What is that? What do you mean signal detect? Basically, I need to listen before talk, just like VP taught me. Okay. Now this signal detect is for basically detecting, is there any other 802.11 traffic out there? Any at all? Okay. Because I can't talk if somebody else is talking. I'm, I can't talk over them. So I'm detecting if there's any, you know, the, if, the, if the preamble is out there, the 802.11 preamble, like basically it's, you know, the announcement. Ah, Okay, and that has to be 4 dB above the noise floor, 4 dB. All right, part two, energy detect. This is any energy at all, 802.11 or not 802.11. It's just energy, energy, okay? And that has to be 20 dB above the signal detect, okay? So here's our little example, okay? So let's just pretend like the noise floor is at minus 95 dBm. Now let's talk about the noise floor for a second. The noise floor is this very nebulous concept. Okay, what is the noise floor? It's like this thermal energy. You know, when I think of the noise floor and I think of like this mysterious, you know, layer of fog that is above the ground as I look out into the horizon and I can see Okay, it's like this thermal energy. It's like on a hot day, you know how you see the waves of sun and the air kind of vibrating? That's what I think of when I think of the noise floor. Okay, it's this nebulous concept, all right? Now here's the hard part and here's the tough part. Everybody measures that slightly differently, okay? It's like this computer might measure the noise floor at minus 95. That computer might measure the noise floor at being at minus 96. Somebody else measures the noise floor at minus 94, okay? And that's important, that's important, okay? The reason why it's so important is because once again, if a device hears any energy at all at a certain level, at a certain point, it's gonna back off. The channel's not clear, okay? It's gonna back off and we actually call it the back off timer, okay? It's gotta back off, it's gotta wait its turn, all right? And not only that, but when we bond channels, okay? You know, we can go from 20 to 40, from 40 to 80. When we bond channels together, we actually raise the noise floor, okay? You think about the channel, okay? And now that it's wider, we're actually scooping up more energy at the bottom and you raise the noise floor by maybe one dB. Okay, that all of this little bit of energy adds up. It adds up, okay? So you gotta be careful when you bond channels, you're gonna raise the noise floor ever so slightly, but that could be the difference between whether the channel is clear or not. All right, so as for example, so the signal detect threshold, okay? So if we had, a noise floor of minus 95, okay? So we have to have our four dB of signal of 802.11 signal over the noise, okay? SNR, signal and noise. So that would make it minus 91. And then we have the energy detect threshold. So we got to tack on another 70, I'm, I'm sorry, another 20 dB. So now we're at minus 71. Now think about this for a second, guys. Okay, and remember, closer to zero, stronger the signal. And when we design Wi-Fi networks, we're typically designing them for minus 65 or minus 67, okay? You wanna be in the minus 60s in order to have a good enough signal to noise ratio in order to achieve the high speeds that we wanna be able to go in Wi-Fi. Those high data rates, those high speeds, they're very sensitive. They're sensitive to noise, okay? And so what's gonna happen is that if there is a lot of commotion in the environment, then you're not gonna be able to go very fast. You're gonna step down to a lower, slower data rate, which is more robust, okay? But think about this for a second, guys. The threshold now is at minus 71. Wow, there's all sorts of things 
at minus 71. That's actually not that, you know, soft. That's pretty loud. It's pretty loud. Okay. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something here on my screen. Okay. So I've got this little product on my computer called Mobileye. And what it allows me to do is see, or see, it's funny I say see, but it's really here, everything going on around my computer. Look at this, guys. I mean, this was me at work yesterday. All right. And so you can see the 7S Corp network, but look at all of the Wi Fi networks all around me. And look, my computer was able to detect things that were really far away at minus 89 and minus 91. And if my computer can hear those things, then it's subject to the clear channel assessment. It's subject to the clear. So there's a sensitivity there. I mean, different computers have different capabilities and they have different sensitivities. And that's why the noise floor is a little bit nebulous. Is it one dB higher for you or two dB lower for me? And then the different sensitivities of the antennas that are inside our computers and our devices, they're gonna pick things up that are really far away. And again, all of that stuff needs to be taken to, into account with regards to the clear channel assessment. Wow, look at all of this, guys. It just goes, keeps going and going and going, all right? And as you can see here, uh, I'm connected to this one right here with the asterisk, okay? And then we detect all of this stuff all around us. This is how we do our, you know, our little analysis is by looking at what your computer can hear all around it. And why is this so important? Because of the clear channel assessment, okay? I'm not gonna be able to operate and transmit and receive unless there's a clear channel, just like VP taught me all those years ago. Okay. All right, so let's continue. Okay. And I, and I, uh, this is really an important concept. So the last bullet on the slide right now, guys, okay, is really important to note. When we do channel bonding, I have to do the clear channel assessment for the first channel, the primary channel, and then also for the secondary channel, all right? So I have to have no energy on not just one channel, which is hard in, in these environments where there's just so much activity all around us, but also two channels. And if I have an 80 megahertz wide channel, I've bonded four channels together. I have to do the clear channel assessment on the first channel, the second channel, the third channel, and the fourth channel. And so there's a trade-off here, okay? There's a trade-off. We do channel bonding because when we bond ch two channels together, we literally double the ability to go fast. So instead of going 100 megabits per second, now I can go 200 megabits per second. Wow, yeah, literally double. Okay. But if I have a really noisy environment, I am now doubling the chances of failing the clear channel assessment, okay? Because I have to perform that check on the first channel, the second channel, and only when both of those channels, if it's a 40 megahertz wide channel where I'm bonding two together, only when I have the all clear on two of those channels, will I then be able to transmit or receive on the full 40 megahertz of width, uh, width of the channel. And the same thing with 80 megahertz, okay? So what's the point of doing it if you have a very noisy environment? And let me show you a picture of what I'm talking about. This is a spectrum analysis chart, okay? This is a organization that has a 40 megahertz wide channel plan, okay? And this is a whole week of spectrum data where we're measuring any energy that we detect, any energy, that's what a spectrum analyzer does. It measures the energy in the air, okay, in the spectrum. And so this is channel 36, and this is channel 40, and this is channel 44. And like I said, this is a 40 megahertz wide channel plan. Do you see a whole lot of 40 megahertz channel width in effect? I don't. Look at this, guys. Look at channel 44. This is the primary channel. 
it's only occasionally, once in a while, that the 40 megahertz width is in effect. You see that right there where my mouse is? 40, so we do the clear channel assessment on channel, the first channel, the primary channel, which is where all the management traffic is. Okay, and we do that because of backward compatibility purposes. And then we have to check and see if there is any energy at all on the second channel. And if there is, then it will revert back and just transmit on the first channel. And that's what happens a lot in these environments. We set up this 20 megahertz wide channel plan and we're not even taking advantage of it. Like what we see on this picture here, we're barely using 20 megahertz wide channel, or in some cases, the 80 megahertz wide channel. We're barely even using it. It is such a waste of spectrum sometimes. You have to be able to see what is going on in the environment before you make this assessment or before you make this decision that we're going to have an 80 megahertz wide channel plan, or we're going to have a 40 megahertz wide channel plan. Okay, You're not even going to be able to take advantage of it. And you're going to be subject to the back off timer and the, 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 the contention window, which is a, another way of saying the back off timer. Basically, it's if I hear any energy, I got to wait my turn. I got to back off. Okay, we call it the back off timer or the contention window where I'm going to wait. I'm given a random number. Okay, and then I'm going to try again. And if I, if I, you know, eventually the protocol is going to muscle its way through and transmit. But this is why we get spotty, inconsistent experiences is because of all of this noise all of around us, all around us, okay? And if we don't understand how Wi-Fi works with regards to the clear channel assessment, then we're not going to be able to plan and make decisions accordingly. Okay? Here's another example. Okay? Look at this, guys. Okay, So this is an apartment building. And what do they do in the apartment building? Okay, Spectrum or Xfinity or whoever you've got, Cox, you know, or over in Europe, maybe, you know, Sky or Orange or, uh, or, or BT, whoever, okay? They hand out routers to everybody in the building and they're all on the same channel, okay? They're all on the same channel. And they're always 80 megahertz wide, okay? What are the, if you're over here on channel 36, what are the chances that you are going to be able to actually use the full 80 megahertz width of the channel? Pretty low, pretty low, especially at night. Okay, there's only one channel 36 guys and it's in the air. It's a frequency and it's a shared resource. And so all of these colored lines represent either a different router, a different SSID, a different uh, customer, a different tenant in the building using Wi-Fi. And so we all have to take turns now. Every single one of the device, and then it's multiple devices. So this could be a person's network and they've got five devices. They've got, you know, they've got two kids using all of these devices over here. And then we've got two adults that are using their devices over, over somewhere else. Everybody has to play nice. They are subject to the clear channel assessment of the 802.11 protocol. They have to listen before talk. This is when people call and they say, oh my gosh, the Wi-Fi is so terrible. I hate it. You're the worst company ever. And it's because they don't understand how it works. Now, I love this picture. And the reason why is because what we have over to the far right is an example of a very smart individual. Okay. What they did is they were able to go in and say, hey, you know what? This is not working. This is bad. And I'm going to find a little quiet part of the spectrum. And it's better that I'm on a skinny 20 megahertz wide channel where there's little activity as opposed to being on this 80 megahertz wide channel, which is very interfered with, very noisy, and subject like you would not believe to the clear channel assessment in a way that's going to make it a very spotty, sketchy, touch and go type of experience. I'll tell you what, guys, channel 165 is like a little hidden gem. <laughs> it's a little, it's a little hidden gem. We go into a lot of environments and we look around and, you know, in a dense environments as well. And sometimes, you know, because it's not, it, it wasn't originally part of uni three, right? Uh, I, I don't even know if it still is part of, if they consider it part of uni three channel 165, somebody maybe can put that in there, but it's sometimes forgotten. And so it's a little hidden gem. 
And I'm telling you, as soon as this individual switched over to channel 165, even though they were on a narrower channel, okay, they didn't have to deal with the noise. They had a much steadier, much more stable experience. Okay. Now, next slide. This is work. This is our multi-tenant building at Seven Signal. Okay, and I took a snapshot of this yesterday when I was in the office. And I love the lineup at the top. Okay, so Jim Vada, you guys probably remember Jim Vada, you know, and we would talk and he would help teach me and he was another one of my Wi Fi mentors. He would teach me about the clear channel assessment. And he would teach me about listen before talk and all of the noise and, you know, the, and how channel bonding is rarely used. And how because and then also because we use channel bonding, uh, you know, um, you know, it's, it's a waste of spectrum many times. He made this statement. He says, you know what? It's a miracle it even works at all. It's incredible. I mean, I go to work and I'm contending and competing for the frequency. My device is listening and all around it hears this noise. And between the, the milliseconds, between the nanoseconds, it's able to figure out time to send my data. It's incredible. It's incredible. And so, I mean, it's, it really is. It really is a miracle. And, and that's why over the years that I've been in this business, I've grown such an affinity for Wi-Fi and the 802.11 protocol because the fact that it muscles through all of this noise in the environment because the, ch the clear channel assessment requires that we do so before transmitting and receiving is really amazing. It's just amazing. Now, next slide. As you guys know, there's some new stuff on the horizon that's pretty exciting, okay? Basically, the government has opened up a whole new highway, a whole new frequency band of spectrum, six gigahertz, right? And this is crazy capacity where you hope that more devices and more access points can all spread out and so that there's less noise, more quiet. It's like going to the library. It's like, oh, I'm going to grab that little cubby in the corner over there. And you're going to grab that little study carol over there. And we can all spread out and have nice, quiet spots okay? because we need quiet in order to concentrate. Wi-Fi needs quiet in order to achieve high data rates, okay, high speeds. So there's a lot of promises out there. A lot of promises with regards to, you know, being able to go fast. I mean, 4K qualm coming down the pike. Holy cow. But I'll tell you what, it is sensitive to noise. And you have to have peace and quiet in order to really achieve those high data rates. It's like trying to hit a dartboard from way across the room. Okay. You're going to miss. You're going to miss. And so you're not going to be able to hit the bullseye, which is the 4K qualm. Okay. Instead, you're going to, you know, hit something that's you know outside of the bullseye and those are going to be your slower speeds okay but if it's nice and uh, quiet then you can hit those higher speeds if you walk up to the dartboard and you're two feet away from it boom you can hit the bullseye okay it's kind of like that so this is really exciting okay wi-fi 6 okay i'm sorry wi-fi 6e is what it's called Okay, don't be confused. So Wi-Fi 6 is just the new name for the 802.11ax protocol. It's just a name change. You know, it's so funny when you see these commercials and it's like brand new Wi-Fi 6. And then this computer over here says 802.11ax. Same thing, guys, same thing. What we're referring to here is something called Wi-Fi 6E. E stands for extended because we're taking the 802.11ax and we're extending it to a whole new highway of spectrum. So it stands for extended. Right. It requires a new radio in your computer that talks on six gigahertz frequencies. Talking to a router or an access point in the ceiling that also has a six gigahertz radio in it talking on those frequencies. Your computer can't just magically start transmitting and receiving on new frequencies. All right, you need new hardware. You need new hardware. All right. Now this is really exciting as you can see, 59, 20 megahertz wide, non-overlapping channels. And even if you do channel bonding, look at this, not too shabby. All right. Now, this isn't available all over the world. I think in Europe, it's just these first 25 right here. But here in the United States, they've given us the entire one 
thousand uh, megahertz of spectrum, which is incredible, incredible and exciting. Okay. Now, there's some other cool things that are coming down the pipe that I wanted to talk about. Okay. So with Wi Fi 6, which is 802.11ax, okay, there's a new scheme out there, a new, um, a new way to do business, let's say. Okay. And it's referred to as OFDMA. Okay. OFDMA is a form of channel sharing. It's like, what did you say, Eric? Eric, I thought you just said that you can't share channels. We have to go one at a time. That's right. We have to go one at a time. But OFDMA allows us to break up a channel into little tiny resource units. Okay, so you can have a little slice of channel 36 and you can have a little slice of channel 36. Whoa, that is a game changer. That is a game changer, guys. Now, guess what? Has anybody really seen it work in practice yet? <sighs> not really, not really. Okay, and especially when you have such a noisy environment with all of this contention taking place and all of this noise all over the place and all of these Wi-Fi networks everywhere, it makes it even harder to use these cool technologies. Now, some people ask me, it's like, Eric, I don't understand. You know, I mean, cellular companies have been doing things like this for a while. And the answer is you're exactly right. They have been. Why? How is it that cell companies can, can do all of this stuff? It's because they own the spectrum, okay? They, they go to the government and they say, we would like to purchase this swath of frequency from you, okay, and reserve it for our private use, all right, the 3.5 you know, gigahertz frequency band of spectrum or whatever, you know, the 2.9 frequency band or whatever, you, you get the idea. And they pay for it so that it is reserved for them. It's all coordinated. They can coordinate everything. It's like they can control the device and they can control what's going on in the tower and they talk to each other and they can coordinate everything because they own the spectrum. Nobody owns the spectrum with Wi-Fi. With wi it's uncoordinated, okay? Because nobody owns it. We all have to share it. And because we all have to share it, that's why we have to follow a protocol to ensure that everybody gets a turn. And we're right back where we started with regards to the clear channel assessment portion of the protocol. Okay, so everything leads back to that. So we can have all of these exciting technologies and they can write things into the spec, but just because they're on paper doesn't mean that they work in practice. And part of the problem is because it's unlicensed spectrum and it's noisy and you're using it and I'm using it and everybody's using it and we have to listen before talk because we have to play nicely okay all right so there's that guys there's that all right there's another topic that i want to review with you guys before we pack it up okay and what i'm talking about here is coverage and propagation okay. we got some cool numbers on the screen for you nerds out there got some nice numbers okay but i'm going to try to break it down and make it a little bit more simple for our audience today so, you know, like when you're listening to your radio in the car and then, you know, you're enjoying your music or your talk show and then you drive out of the city into the country, what happens? Radio station turns into static. Exactly. These radio waves of Wi-Fi, they can't propagate forever. Okay. They're going to spread out. The little particles are going to dissipate and then they're going to disappear. All right. So they can't go forever. But what you need to know is that, and without getting into all of the physics and all of the math, like what you see on the screen here, but what you need to know is that low frequencies have longer wavelengths and those longer wavelengths can travel further through space than frequencies that have short wavelengths or small wavelengths, okay? They peter out more quickly. And in Wi-Fi, this is really important guys, because 2.4 as the lower frequency, Okay, can go approximately twice as far as what we typically say, twice as far as five gigahertz. Wow. Okay. You know, like those, uh, sometimes on a clear night, you can pick up like an AM radio station from across the country or on the other side of the world. It's because of those low AM frequencies, they have long wavelengths. And so they can travel far on a clear night, uninhibited. So 
And we just talked about, and we just looked at a picture that showed the capacity of 2.4 versus five. Okay, 2.4, not a lot of channels, not a lot of capacity. So it's like, I always tell people, it's like, hey, you know, have you ever been like in a parking lot and then it's like, boop, all the Wi-Fi networks pop up on your phone. You're like, oh my gosh, I can get Wi-Fi way out here. Well, don't get too excited because it's probably 2.4 and it's going to be really crowded and really noisy and really interfered with, all right? You got to get close. You got to get close in order to take advantage of five gigahertz. You got to get even closer to take advantage of six gigahertz, okay? Six gigahertz, okay? The, the cell is even smaller. I remember a few years ago when they announced like, uh, you know, um, uh, 60 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, remember that? And I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds incredible. You're going to be able to go so fast. And I remember Don Sloan at Seven Signal, he said to me, well, don't get too excited because you're going to have to be right next to wherever you're transmitting data to, okay? Because those itty bitty milli waves, they peter out quick. Those itty, those super high frequencies have little itty bitty milli waves and they're, they can't go very far. They're just going to break apart in three feet, <laughs> okay? So, I mean, the, the practical applications uh, kind of went way, way down. So again, just by understanding this simple concept, okay, this simple concept, it helps you then paint a picture of how challenging Wi-Fi is in these complex environments, in these complex environments, okay? Of course, we have to worry about barriers to propagation as well. I mean, these little milli waves, I mean, they're, they're not gonna be able to get through sheetrock. I mean, that's how fragile they are. Okay, but these big long waves, like the 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 the, the radio waves of two point four, they can propagate more easily through surfaces as well. Okay, and in Wi-Fi, the two surfaces that we concern ourselves with most are concrete and metal. Okay, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Sometimes with concrete, it's good because it shields us from our noisy neighbors, right? And so it's not seeping in. Sometimes it's bad. Like, for instance, when my dad calls me up and he says, Eric, I can't get Wi-Fi in my house. Okay. And it's like, the router's in the next room. I'm in the living room. What's going on? It, the router's in the bedroom right over there. I'm like, okay, dad, well, what's between you and the bedroom? It's a big concrete wall, right? Because he lives in Florida. So the interior walls are made out of concrete block, just like the exterior walls of the house are too, for hurricane protection. So I'm like, dad, you got to get that thing out in the open. All right. That thing has an omnidirectional antenna in it. And so it's just blasting that signal into the wall, okay? The signal can't sneak around the wall and get to you, all right? So you got to get that thing out in the open and you got to be proud of it. You got to be proud of it. Right? That's what I always tell people. What's the number one thing that you can do to improve coverage in your house is get that thing in the middle of your home. Figure out a way. But don't put it next to the refrigerator, okay? It's like a big metal box. That's not going to work. Let's talk about metal. The radio waves are going to reflect off of the metal, okay? And they're going to bounce around all over the place. And again, sometimes that's good, okay? In Wi-Fi, we call it multipath, where we depend upon the signal bouncing around all over the place in order to get the signal, in order to achieve what we're trying to achieve. We, we want it to do that, okay? And then sometimes it, it doesn't work because, um, you know, just in certain environments, it's just the signal's not going where we think it's going. And there you have it. All right, one more topic and then we're done. Let's talk about devices, guys, okay? Here's the problem with devices. They're proprietary, okay? There is no, hey, you follow um, a standard for how you're gonna develop your Wi-Fi adapters and drivers, okay? They all are different. And that's why when you have Apple devices on a Wi-Fi network, they behave radically different from Windows like HP or Dell or Lenovo devices when they're on a Wi-Fi network. This is why it's so challenging to design a Wi-Fi network today for environments that <clears throat> are trying to accommodate all of those devices I just mentioned. I mean, one could argue that a MacBook wasn't designed for the enterprise. It was designed for you know, the consumer market. <clears throat> and therefore, you know, Apple has made certain decisions that say, you know what, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to behave this way when I detect certain signals. I'm going to behave that way when I detect other signals. If the signal strength is too low, I'm going to do this. If it's too high, I'm going to do, you get the idea. 
Okay. And then Intel comes along and they have their adapters. And those Intel adapters behave completely differently. And then if you have Qualcomm adapters or Realtek adapters, they behave differently because they wrote the software. The drivers are the software that governs how the particles in the air are going to be interpreted. That then is going to govern how your adapter works with your computer in order to make decisions, okay? So that's why you know we, we call it like sticky clients where some devices, they get to a really low signal strength and they don't roam to something very close by right overhead, okay? Bad drivers, okay? It's the drivers that are making those decisions. That's not a Wi-Fi network problem. That's a device problem, okay? So you got to be aware of these things. And if you go online and you, and you do some research on Apple devices, you'll see that they don't roam until they get to like minus 73, minus 74. It's insane. You know, and then all of your uh, devices in the office are Windows devices, and they roam when they get to minus 70 or minus 71. How are you supposed to design a Wi-Fi network that accommodates both? Not easy. Very challenging. But if you know what we're talking about here, okay, if you know that, you know, then you can try to plan accordingly or you can explain to others what's happening, okay? All right, one more thing that I want to tell you about devices here is that they're not all the same, of course, because of the drivers, the software, but also they're not the same because of the hardware, okay? Now, these two computers, they might look the same, but they're not. You got to read the fine print because the computer on the right is not even capable of getting onto a five gigahertz network, okay? It has what we call a BGN adapter. And with regards to Wi-Fi protocols, I try to teach people look for the letter A because A is the amendment to the 802.11 standard signifying support for five gigahertz. So if it said A, B, G, N, you'd probably be okay. A, N, no problem. N, too risky. All right, don't go there. Don't go there. I know that N supports five gigahertz, but if it just, if it says your wireless adapter is 802.11 N, it's too risky. You don't want to go there. The details are vague. This little fun fact is way down the page. All right. Now over here on the left, AC, no problem. AX, awesome. That's the latest standard that we're on. Okay. Now to help customers out with this alphabet soup, because it's, it's, kind of complicated. The Wi-Fi Alliance a couple of years ago says, you know what, let's change the nomenclature. So now 802.11ac, we refer to as Wi-Fi 5. 802.11ax, we now refer to as Wi-Fi 6. Not to be confused with Wi-Fi 6e, which is a whole new frequency band of spectrum that requires a new adapter in your computer on six gigahertz talking to a six gigahertz frequency or radio that's in a home router or access point. Okay, totally different. And then when Wi-Fi 7 comes out, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have all forgotten about these letters. And really, like I said, it's for the consumer. It's for the consumer. The consumer is getting you know, confused. I can't even believe they sell these computers anymore, BGN and adapter computer, but they do. They sell them. Can you believe this? I just got this off of the internet just a, a couple of weeks ago. And I, you know, I was looking, I was looking, and I can't believe it. I mean, people are going to buy this computer, take it home, and say, man, this computer stinks. But not anymore. Now you know. Now you know what it takes. What does it take to have a great Wi-Fi experience? Gosh, it's a confluence of events, of, uh, of factors, guys. It could be your device. Your device is not capable of going fast. Your device is making poor decisions because it's got crummy software drivers governing the wireless LAN adapter, okay? It could be that it is just so noisy in this environment that even though it's hard, trying as hard as it can to muscle through and remember, the 802.11 protocol is very robust, but it has to listen for a clear channel before it can transmit, okay? And if it is just noisy, 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 and you're surrounded by all of this razzmatazz, then your Wi-Fi experience is going to be sketchy and spotty. The clear channel assessment is foundational to how Wi-Fi works, and that's really the one thing that you need to walk away from here, is understanding the listen before talk nature of the protocol. And even though Wi-Fi 6 and beyond are promising channel sharing, similar to what cellular carriers do, it's not quite here yet. And there's actually concern that we're really never going to be able to take full advantage 
just because of the unlicensed nature of Wi-Fi and all of the channel and all of the uh, uh, all of the interference that happens as a result. It's going to be very difficult to do. But we'll see. We'll see. And that's the exciting part. Well, there you have it, guys. There you have it. Wow. That was a lot of material in a short amount of time. Hope maybe you learned a thing or two. Okay, that would be great. And um, I'm going to bring Heather back in. Heather, are you there? Here I am. All right, what a deal. All right, so maybe we can answer a question or two. I'll do the best I can. Um, but, um, you know, other than that, I just want to say thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Wonderful session. Very active chat. Lots of great feedback. We do have a few questions. See if you can take a stab at some of these. My best. Um, all right. So for us, it, it seems like we're getting a lot of use case stuff. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of it depends, but here we go. All right. Forrest is asking, <laughs> let's say you have a filled auditorium with 300 seats and only 2.4 gigahertz can be used. It is known that three APs, channels 1, 6, and 11, cannot practically accommodate the traffic. This is a real situation out of foreign sight. How could it be done and how was it handled in the old days when only 802.11b was available? Oh boy. So did he, the first part of your question was 300 people. Is that what I heard? Yep, an auditorium with 300 seats and only 2.4 can be used. Okay, so what, what can you do? You can learn about patience. You can <laughs> learn about being patient. Um, and what do I mean by that is because um, if you've got, you know, three access points, I mean, maybe four access points, five, it, you know, everybody has to take a turn. Okay, mm -hmm. so everybody is subject to the clear channel assessment. Wi-Fi speeds are going to be slow. They're going to be slow. There's a lot of noise in the environment, and you just have to learn patience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, you know, when 802.11n came along, and we and we had channel bonding and five gigahertz. I mean, it was so exciting because, uh, and that's where we just saw this massive increase in speeds uh, because we had more channels so that we can spread out the load, and more channels and more spreading out means less noise concentrated all on one channel and or one part of the spectrum. Um, so that's my best advice is you just got to learn patience. And I don't know if somebody else, um, you know, I mean, if, if anybody in the chat agrees or disagrees with that statement, but that is the, the simple answer in my opinion. Yeah, I've seen a pretty hearty consensus like Steve King says, yeah, you can pray. <laughs> so Caesar on track with that one. Very good. Um, I'm going to hop over to one from Terry because I know this one's going to float your boat, Eric. What are some tools you can use to analyze your environment? Oh, brother. Okay. Well, of course. I mean, we make the most amazing ones uh, on the planet. Um, so, but, but here, here's the thing. So, I mean, there are tools for design and then there's tools for troubleshooting and there's tools for ongoing optimization and performance management. Okay. So, I mean, obviously when it comes to design, you have to start with good design. Oh my gosh. I mean, you can have all of the tools in the world, but if you don't have that foundational good design, uh, then you're hosed. I mean, everybody in the industry has kind of standardized on, on using a, uh, a system like the Ekahau Sidekick. And this is where you're gonna walk around and it's gonna map out in your environment where you should place access points um, and how far the signal should propagate and when, uh, you should, when you should and shouldn't reuse a channel. Okay, like if you're too close, you don't want to use the same channel. You got to use a different channel until you get so far away that it's like, okay, now we can reuse that channel. Again, in an attempt to cut down on that noise and cut down on that channel contention. Okay, and then there's um, troubleshooting tools. You know, people will walk around with like a fluke air check. Oh, wow, what a cool device. Expensive, it's like $3,000. Boy, is it cool. And you walk around, it's going to show you what's going on in the air all around you and what's going on. And then you have ongoing performance management. And obviously, that's where Seven Signal comes in. Seven Signal, what we do is we put our system out there and daily, weekly, monthly, you're getting information in order to ensure. That we've had that we have good performance. If we don't, we're going to quickly identify the root cause so that we can remediate. 
Uh, and then obviously it allows us to be proactive. It's like we want problems brought to us because we're in monitor mode. So we want to see issues come to us so that we can take care of them before they get really big and hairy and out of control. Okay, so where Wi-Fi is mission critical, uh, you know, that's the kind of system, a performance management system and optimization system is what we need. And a lot of people say, you know, well, you know, once I've got a great design, what do I need anything else for? Guys, Wi-Fi is a living, breathing beast. And you have to tame the beast on an ongoing basis. Okay, we have new devices coming in. We have new protocols coming out. I mean, this is like, and it's in the air. We can't see it. We can't hear it, right? But I know who can. Mm -hmm. There you go. Very good. Perfect. Very well-rounded answer. Um, let's see. Oh, I did get a question. This one's for me uh, about the slides with the recording. Yes, we will give you all the things. They will come into your inbox tomorrow. So. Stay tuned for that. Um, let's see. I think we probably have time for one, maybe two more. Um, one. Getting see, hungry. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Daniel, I saw this come through in the chat too. So do we have info on how many DB, how much DB loss has been seen? Uh, it is to use a 6E adapter on a computer. Sorry, I'm trying to. Yeah, I think he's probably, he's probably talking about is like, okay, how is like coverage changing with six, with Wi Fi 6E, six gigahertz? You know what? The jury's not out yet. Um, you know, we don't, we don't, there's not a lot of Wi Fi 6E, six gigahertz out there in the market yet. It's just a little bit. We're, we, I mean, obviously we've got customers all over the world. We don't see a lot of it out there yet. We're seeing more and more devices with 6E adapters, but we don't see a lot of enterprises deploying 6E um, networks yet, okay? However, one thing that you need to know, okay? So for, we talked about the, you know, the inverse square law and signal propagation and the higher the frequency, the, the, the less far it can go. That's gonna be a real reality in six gigahertz. And especially because the swath of spectrum is so large, okay? If you're on one side of the spectrum versus the other side of the spectrum, there is gonna be some, some loss. There is gonna be some signal loss. And five gigahertz, not really. You can be on channel 36, and there's really not gonna be much difference in terms of propagation if you're on channel you know, 149. But in six gigahertz, because the, uh, because the frequency band is so large, there actually is going to be some loss of signal, and you are going to have to accommodate that. It's complicated, and that's why we're that's why it's exciting, guys. We're in this business because it's complicated, uh, and and we're going to try to unpack it, and we're going to try to create and develop awesome solutions to ensure that we can take advantage of new technology and to ensure that people have the best experience possible wirelessly. <laughs>